And Lucrecia Rodriguez, who's the executive in the Central American Center. So thank you very much for joining us, colleagues, and we hope um, it is a very productive uh, day session. Now, before starting, I would like to say how the event will be. I'm going to start it with a small presentation with the aim of putting Latin America in the global context and where we are towards the COP27, uh, followed by, in a, by another presentation of Federico Villarreal. He's going to give us more uh, a policy point of view, and then we'll have space for having a conversation with um, our panelists. And with this, I would like to start. Okay, obviously climate change is a uh, very complex challenge for the agricultural and livestock sector because it's got uh, three components, the vulnerability of climate change effects, then how the sector is impacted, but it's also a great source of emissions of greenhouse gases effect, which is uh, part of a problem. And then we have also several opportunities. The sector has several opportunities to help reduce this uh, emissions and sequestration of carbon. Um, the topic of this presentation has two lines of work that we're performing um, to put the region more into context. Um, it'll be the first one on where we are in terms of emissions, going a bit to what has been seen throughout the time. This we do it with David Laborde and um, Abu um, Mamoun and how this climate change um, is affecting us. I want to thank their thing, Thomas. Um, and Ricky Robertson for his uh, contributions. Why are these two subjects going to be important? Because we need to have instruments to be able to prioritize investments and to design policies and incentives that are gonna be more efficient. So as I said, mentioning the uh, issue of emissions, these are the latest uh, data that have been uh, presented by the um, uh, FAO in terms of emissions. And what I want to show on this graph is the going from global to regional to give some effects in the country, in the countries. In 2019, which is the last bar, emissions of agriculture, uh, global agriculture, in uh, change of land, as well as also mm, the production part, it was almost 11,000 million equivalent in carbon dioxide. So as you can see, it's been very stable in the last uh, 30 years, as we can see it on the slide. There has been a balance between the increase of emissions by the uh, production, but there was also a decrease because the change in the use of land. This is deforestation. In the case of Latin America, more specifically in the Southern Cone, it's been an example of that. Now, if we look at the regions, emissions in 2019, were the biggest ones in Asia in absolute terms with 4,000 million tons, and then followed by Oceania in Latin America in a per capita basis um, of four to six tons per person. Now, the largest increase in the last uh, 30 years have been given in Africa, which has grown in 30%, while the highest decrease has been in Latin America and the United States with around a 20% due to deforestation in a, part, in a part of Latin America. And looking at my country, we see that Brazil, Indonesia, and China represented more than 50% of global emissions in agriculture. Now, looking more the source of emissions, what we can see in this uh, slide, in this chart, is looking at the, um, the green part, green, pink, and, and, and uh, orange is cattle production livestock. It tells us how we should be looking for interventions or investments where it's gonna be more efficient for our purpose and how to mitigate or adapt to climate change. Now, looking at the same data of the previous slides, but measured by subregion, we could see that um, livestock represents a great percentage of emissions produced. There are some differences depending on the subregion. The first one is that the Andean and Central American countries have kept a trend uh, trend app in the sector, while the Caribbean and the uh, 
Mercosur countries have uh, decreased in 2019, since 2019. The second one is that uh, Peru has the highest percentage of emissions in the farm due to uh, the use of um, agricultural inputs. And then South America has more use of synthetic fertilizers. The fourth one is that the Indian countries in Mercosur have a bit more in the burn of the savanna, which is the uh, purple one. And the last, the last one is that rice is still important for the Caribbean and the Andean countries with their emissions. Now, this is the trend of what we, what we have seen in terms of how we're doing in terms of emissions as a region and compared with other um, regions of the world. Now, this, uh, these slides coming up, uh, what we want to measure there is using information of 30 models or models of circulation, which is climate models, under the highest standard emission scenario or the most uh, pessimistic, if we could say that way, which has been reported in the last report, in the sixth report of the IPCC, which is the SSP 585, in comparing averages then of two periods, uh, averages of 20 years, of two periods, of 1991 to 2010, with the uh, averages of um, 2041 to 2060. And these figures were showing a comparison in the yearly precipitation, changing the change in this uh, 30 models. What we can notice in this example is that grade reduction is given and precipitations are going to happen in Venezuela, um, Guyana, northern part of Brazil. And there are high increases in the Andean um, ranges, mountain ranges in Brazil and the southern part uh, along with Argentina and uh, Uruguay. Now that map that I just showed is the median, right? Now, what would happen if instead we look at the two um, extremes of the two ends of this uh, limits of compensation, looking at the percentile of the 10th and 9th percentile, what we wanna see what this is, that if we look at the two extremes, there is a great range of uncertainty as, uh, as we saw in one of the maps, which is the one of a tenth is represented in orange and in green, what gives us a view or a little bit of a different insight on where we are. Why is it important to take uh, this into account? Not only the median, but the two extremes is so that whenever we make decisions, we need to consider also this kind of information. Now, what we just saw was about precipitation of rainfalls. Now, what would happen in terms of changes in temperature? This figure shows the maximum temperature per day um, in a median per year or every year. In the median, it shows the temperatures are going to increase a bit less in the southern corner in the Caribbean uh, with some homogeneity in all the region uh, compared to the uncertainty that we saw previously in regards to rainfalls or precipitations. Now. Just to give you an example, if we look at the 90th percentile, which will be the most, um, the warmest uh, scenario, what these models show is that um, the Amazon basins, especially the center of the Amazon region of the Brazilian Amazon, could experience a great increase in temperature, which could have a meaningful impact in the ecosystem, just um, for information purposes. Now, we already saw the part of emissions. We saw how precipitations are going to change and temperatures are going to change also. And what impact is this going to have now in uh, yield of some uh, products? So to model this effect of climate in yield uh, using the um, uh, SSP model and this um, yield for a reference measure in 2005, comparing it with the yield that is going to happen uh, later on, um, showing five of the models that we mentioned before using the same scenario, which is the most uh, pessimistic. Um, this study, we did it for seven products, which was um, uh, soybean, um, wheat, rice, uh, sorghum, potato, and corn. So this was kind of a calculation. So this chart shows uh, soybean, and I'm going to highlight that in this, in this case, what would be affected in soybean with no irrigation, in this case would be in 2050 compared to 2005. What we can see there is that in this large emission scenario, not taking into account the part that could be taken from uh, 
fertilization of carbon dioxide in uh, leaves, that there are some studies that calculate that it could observe it. What we see is that Brazil and Guyana are responsible for two thirds of um, soybean crops that are gonna have a reduction of 22% in the median with a minimum of 26 and a maximum of 17. Now, one more example to see will be the impact on corn. It's exactly the same, but in this case, corn is a product in which it shouldn't be benefited too much by fertilization of carbo, uh, from carbon dioxide. But we see that there, is, um, uh, there isn't much of a difference in this chart, but the message, the takeaway would be pretty much the same. It's losses in yield. There's gonna be high losses, higher losses in Brazil, Guyana, and the Caribbean region. But we foresee that all the region in Latin America would lose yield uh, due to this, this, this um, scenario. Now, one more important point here is what we're seeing here is just about Latin America, but in the case of corn, all the world would be affected in terms of yield. Um, so we'll have to see what would be that comparative loss of the region compared to the rest of the world. Now, as we said, climate change will, will bring extreme temperatures uh, water uh, scarcity, and especially volatility, as the impact as well as in terms of extreme weather and other consequences. So this kind of methodology is useful for the analysis of possible scenario at the time of uh, prioritized investments. Due to the fact that many investments are designed for 20 to 30 years, investments need to make sense in a variety of possible future climates. Um, we'll need to have that into account. Obviously, in order to face challenges, we're gonna need uh, increase, to increase the resilience of the sector, um, measuring negative impacts, um, preventing them through insurance, monitoring and other implements and observing and reconstructing with what we're also gonna need some funding or financing. So what shall we thinking about? First of all, is to have the appropriate financing level besides having an innovation and financial mechanisms that help um, reduce the risk in the agricultural and livestock sector. The second one is to work in the measurements, including all natural resources, not only mm, technologies to have uh, uh, on emissions, but other aspects. And this methodology needs to have also uh, harmonized uh, indicators and also application of policies and regulations as for instance, um, labeling, not only to be there in emissions, but to cover other indicators that also have an impact in the environment. Now, the other one is um, the digital impact. We need to have solutions that include the trade-offs, right? Trade-offs in terms of emissions and food uh, security, um, agriculture or farmers and the impact in the climate. So this, these are the questions that we're trying to answer in this. And by this, I would like to um, um, wrap up here and to give the floor to Federico Villarreal. Federico, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Valeria. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here in this event. Of course, thank you to the IFPRI for their organization and USAID, of course, for their support to the development of this event. My presentation is absolutely aligned to what Valeria just mentioned and complements in a way her presentation uh, because we are going to talk about the agriculture in Latin America, specifically ministries in the Americas. We have been working with the ICA and with partners such as IFPRI and others. And we have been working to involve um, the agriculture in the Americas in the conversations about environment and climate. So I will start my brief presentation. Why is it important for the agriculture in the Americas, the next COP, COP27? First of all, because agriculture would be the main issue or one of the priorities of this meeting. And this is of course a consequence uh, uh, why this 
meeting is going to take place in Egypt. It's important for them and it's important for us. Second of all, because this is the right moment to consolidate the agriculture as one of the main issues of climate conversations. We, um, we have been one of the main leaders of the conversations on Coronivia, but agriculture itself in the COP will have a main access uh, in the agreement of Coronivia. And to be able to achieve that, it's necessary support on the highest level to treat agriculture as a main issue in the COP. That doesn't mean that we should involve all, ministry, all ministries of agriculture or agriculture in general. So we believe that it's extremely important for agriculture in the Americas, the representation of ministries in uh, agriculture and being there physically and being there with a voice and with a position in a way, on the different discussions or conversations that happen there. So we need to, we need that the voices of the ministries of agriculture in Latin America have a voice there. This sounds very simple in principle, but it is not, it is not. Because this implies to look for common ground that allow us to express our voices and to see the difference that we have and reach an agreement. COP will take place in nine days, I believe, in Egypt. But the result of being in COP27 is the consequence of a series of activities that began at the beginning of the year. First of all, we had a meeting in May of this year, where about 20 ministries of agriculture mentioned or talked about how to address jointly the need to transform the agri-food sector in response to climate change, specifically to have awareness of this issue and the timing in which we are discussing all of this. Some, sometimes in political conversations or in the political day today doesn't necessarily happen. Then in June, again this year, we had the Summit of the Americas in the US, where countries with their um, respective ministers of agriculture participated. And so we had res specific representations from each country. There was debates on several issues and we reached a statement at the end in which we declared the importance of bringing agriculture of the Americas in the COP27. Then in July, in the ECOM headquarters in Costa Rica, we had a meeting between Africa and America's um, ministries. We did this and we talked and emphasized in how agriculture needs to be taken into account in the climate change conversations. And the need to consolidate the continental um, alliances and partnerships because agriculture and the presence of agriculture in the framework of global discussions exceeds by far the limits of the um, hemisphere of, of the Americas. Then in also July of this year, again, in the headquarters of the ICA, we had the agriculture, um, Inter-American Agriculture Board. This, um, we have, we had representations from all 13 countries, members of this um, body. And we talked about the work that we have been doing. And they also emphasized through a resolution, which is the, the mandate that the Institute gets to drive the 
progress so that agriculture in the Americas has a voice and a presence in the COP27. And finally, in September of this year, so a bit over a month ago, also in the ICA headquarters, we had an America summit on the um, on agriculture in climate change or climate action. And so we consolidated the preparation and the agreement that countries of the Americas, the agriculture of the Americas will take out, will take to the COP27, which again will happen in nine days. It's worth mentioning that this was an on-site meeting and we had great participation and engagement from min, um, ministries of the Americas, as well as other strategic partners who are key to this job, to, to this work and this um, progress. We had several uh, organizations there and there was great consensus and support on the need to get to that consensus meaning that we know there are several differences, but we need to find common ground so that we can go to the COP articulately, all 34 countries. This is how we reached um, an agreement. I would say a unique agreement given the issue, although not the only one, the ICA, had previously, a year before, reached consensus on the needed transformations of the agri-food sector. This happened over the summit in the framework of the United Nations last year. And so this would be the second consensus to which we reach involving messages, a common message that the agriculture of the Americas needed to be um, in the conversation of climate change. Some key messages that we want to share. I'm going to share a link at the end, which summarizes, or not really summarizes, but broadens everything that I'm saying here. And you will see the text of those messages. But the core of this discussion is what are those messages that we're going to take there. First of all, that the climate and food crisis. Um, agriculture is part of the solution on both of those crises. This highlights that we cannot affect food security to resolve climate crisis. And at the same time, we cannot tackle climate um, food crisis affecting climate crisis. Those are not contrary solutions. They need to go hand in hand. We need to find solutions to both crises and agriculture is part of the solution. With uh, aligned with what Valeria said, we need more and better policies and investments to reach better sustainability of agriculture. We need specifically national, but mostly international investments to um, strengthen those progresses that have been made. The costs and risks of climate crisis cannot be exclusively assumed by producers and um, by uh, producers in general. This is so we can tackle the consequences that come with the climate crisis. Another message is to strengthen the protagonism of ministries of agriculture in the climate conversations. This conversations, of course, don't happen only in the COP. The UN body in charge of that works the entire year and so not only on the COP. And so we need to have these conversations at national and regional levels 
to again emphasize that agriculture is part of the solution and what are those transformations that the agriculture needs to take to be able to tackle climate crisis and um, strengthen food security. And then we need to take science-based decisions and recognizing that the solutions need to adapt to local realities. There are two key things here, the importance of science and information to make decisions as accurate as possible. And second of all, it doesn't consider that one solution will be the only solution. We realize that there are different realities in each region. And so we need to take that into account to not leave anyone behind and to include key stakeholders both for economic and social development of our countries. The next step, as I mentioned, this is the result of the consensus of all 34 secretariat and uh, ministries of um, agriculture of the Americas and the messages that we're going to take to the COP27. How are we going to take these messages to the COP? We're going to have a pavilion in the most restricted part of the COP. The COP is a meeting, to those of you who don't know, it gathers between 20 and 40,000 people of all countries that take part in that, in that convention, um, fin funding uh, bodies, different organizations, and so all of them will be together to discuss the climate change um, conversation. And so we have great partners that are uh, building right now a pavilion that we called the House of the um, Sustainable Agriculture of the Americas. A few features that the pavilion will have besides the physical space. The events are divided in five main events or main issues. So first of all, we will have um, political advocacy events. We will have food security and resilience. Um, the voice of the producers in the climate crisis, because of course producers are the soul of agriculture. Then uh, catalyzing financing, um, markets and innovation to support the transition and meet dairy and climate change. So this will be um, where the agriculture in the Americas will be. So we will, the agriculture of the Americas will have a key um, role in this uh, event. Our message is strong because it talks about how the social actor will express their voices, both politically, but also technically over several events. And so to wrap up, these are some images. So when I talk about pavilion, what am I talking about? This is what we will have. It's a small space because all spaces are small. There are several pavilions, but What's important, we think, is that the agriculture of the Americas pavilion is different from other spaces that will be at the convention. And this does not belong to a single organization. It belongs to agriculture in the Americas. So all ministries and um, secretaries of agriculture will have a voice there. These are some of the partners that are working with us that have sponsored us in some cases and who are working with us to build this pavilion, both on physical spaces, but also in the articulation of our voices. Um, we have Lucrecia, who's also here with us uh, from the CAC, who have contributed heavily to the building of what at the beginning of the year seemed a utopia. And today it is a reality. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Federico, especially for showing the importance of having unity in the region. Since we're talking about climate change, what a country does does not necessarily is kept inside the country, but it, it has an impact in the neighbor country and in other regions, showing the um, heterogeneity of region, each of them will have a different uh, capacity to react and to adapt in regards to climate change. But it has to be a conversation, constant communication and collaboration among the whole region. So by this, I wanted to open the second part of these events, which is gonna be our conversation with the panelists that I already introduced at the beginning of these events. And uh, whoever needs to know more about each of them, please go on our website uh, in the link of the events where there is a link towards the curriculums and information about each of the panelists. Now by this, I would like to start with a question which perfectly matches with um, what Federico just, uh, just mentioned. And it is saying, okay, what are the main three challenges you consider in regards to agri agri agricultural and food uh, problems in the region and before the climate crisis. I would like to start with Walter. Walter, if you could answer this question, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning to all of you and thank you, um, Valeria and all the organizers for the uh, opportunity of participating on these events. First of all, I believe um, the characteristic and the size of these challenges implies um, that it is way better that countries work, states communicating among one another, exchanging experiences, results, success cases, or failure cases. So we're at a new scenario, and therefore maybe a new generation of policies is required where rural development problems, the um, increase of agricultural and livestock uh, productivity, the uh, development with inclusion, et cetera, social and economic uh, and environmental um, actions, incorporate the climate action in a comprehensive way. So historical policies didn't have that climate action and now we are in need of doing it. After the Paris Agreement, it is reformulated. The fact that it is just concentrated in developed countries, but now all countries will have to, to uh, take an ambitious climate action in regards to adaptation. And I would like to emphasize the, um, the vision of of, um, of youth, as it was said, many adaptation actions have many other dimensions as mitigation, the care of, of land or soil. So a co-benefits vision is more is richer than a strictly limited vision to just one dimension. But in order to adapt, and as it was properly expressed by Valeria's presentation, agricultural of this continent is facing great challenges in terms of uh, adaptation. And adaptation is not the same in the whole region. It's not even the same inside each country. It's not even the same in each item or line item inside um, each country. So we'll have to start by better understanding how it can get to affect us depending on the climate scenarios 20, 30, 40 years from now is key. And uh, as a second point, today in the agricultural policies menu, we have on the table the need of being part of um, global instruments as it is, for instance, the um, the uh, the uh, SDG uh, for uh, objectives or goals for 2030, which is uh, improving the irrigations. And as it is the goals related to the Paris agreements, 
but also as uh, seasonal adaptation plans. So um, I believe a good experience of the policy is that from the ministry, whenever it was understood in 2010, the core importance of adaptation with co-benefits, which are social economic co-benefits, the minister defined that priority and we came back to say, okay, and what does adapt adapting means? Um, who adapts? How shall we adapt? So there we realized of the heterogeneity of the problem and of the importance of um, covering the different dimensions of the problem in a medium and long-term national adaptation plan. And I believe that we were the 13th country in getting a national adaptation plan and the first one in registering a sectorial national adaptation plan for agriculture. Formulating the plan it's, in itself is a progress, but then we have to implement it. And to implement it, we need resources. And there it is related to one more question and it is how do we get that financing? And finally, as a third um, element, not to go beyond the three minutes, I think in this uh, learning stage, it is key to, in, to link research, development, and innovation. That process uh, involves science, as what Federico was saying. And it also uh, involves uh, main uh, stakeholders of reproductive sectors, um, producers, and those three legs, which are public policies, public policies, science, and technology, and social stakeholders have a lot to contribute in the formulation of policies and they are key. So we need to strengthen uh, links with research and development so that it can provide better grounds for uh, designing of policies. And we need to also formulate uh, policies that promote inclusion. Now, in regards to new challenges, we cannot have the same responses as before. We need new responses. That means innovation is core to the um, process of, of uh, accounting for the challenges that we're having in front. Just, just, just one more example. Very interesting when you were showing Valeria, the scenario with CO2 fertilization is an amazing scenario. The other one is less important because, I mean, fertilization positively affects the leaves of the plant because, um, it's a plant of C3 type photosynthesis and it responds to CO2. It's, it doesn't happen to corn. It doesn't mean that we, need to, that we need to stop planting corn, that we just need to plant soybean. There's another problem there. So if we only plant soybean, we'll have other kinds of problems, problems of soil, um, carbon uh, in the soil. So um, there is an example there that there aren't, there, there aren't any simplistic solutions. Local solutions are that we have a lot to learn among um, ourselves or one another from what other people are doing. And that's gonna be important in this process. I'm sorry for taking more than three minutes. Thank you very much, Walter. And we're, we'll be answering, we'll be, you answered a question that we had for you, like it was what kinds of policies should be promoted or avoided. So thank you very much. Um, your your comment was very um, appropriate. So um, Sabine, I would like to ask you the same. What are the challenges towards the uh, sector given the current situation? Yes, thank you very much, Valeria. Thank you for the invitation to participate in this event, which I believe is key, especially with these goals that we're proposing ourselves. And maybe I would like to propose three like more macro challenges. Then there will be a lot of uh, specific points, but I believe it'll be mitigation, adaptation, and financing. If we need to summarize them in a very aggregated way, mitigation a bit because of what you're proposing, Valeria, initially, where the um, agricultural and food sectors are participants in emissions and they have the commitment of starting to reduce them. That means nowadays, 
we're, we're accounting for a third of global emissions. And as all the rest of the sectors, we need to go towards mitigation of the latter. And especially in that trajectory that the Paris Agreement establishes, we do not only need to reduce us all, all the sectors, but we have an additional commitment in avoiding emissions. So they're, they're all the uh, nature-based uh, solutions where the sector that work, work in a natural capital, we have even a higher challenge, right? And then this related to an increase in, in productivity. You say those trade-offs that generate um, sustainable food systems where we need to increase the food production, which we know it's been de-accelerated in, in the last years, in the last years per capita. So obviously we need to keep on producing more. And that's where um, you were mentioning about the uh, utilization of fertilizers. We cannot think in an increase in productivity without thinking in a change of uh, soil. That means increasing to a higher surface without mm, uh, needing more fertilizers with, uh, and to, to feed the planet and the world in the agenda 2030. In terms of adaptation, it's a great challenge because we need to produce more, but we are a highly vulnerable sector to climate change. And where nowadays we're seeing that maybe there are some status demonstrating that the last seven years of increase of productivity could be um, subtracted uh, related to the impact that the uh, climate change has had in production. So obviously it's a current challenge that we need to uh, have, that we need to work on. And the specific examples is the draft that Argentina is going through. And it is demonstrating that we are in the middle of a very important problem and with a very high challenge and not to go beyond the time Financing. For financing for me is a great challenge because again, here we are inside a context and inside a trajectory, inside to, uh, goals and um, where developed and developing countries are on the same path where we do not only need to produce more with a better environmental performance, but we, besides, we need to develop ourselves, right? And that's the great uh, balance of trade-off that we need to start to play on in Latin America, where for this, it is essential to deep dive, and that gives our rise probably to the next question, which is financing. It's a financing that has to get to a productive system. It has to be way easier, and there has to be innovation in this uh, financing mechanisms so that this is uh, really possible for the region. It's a developing region. Sabine, thank you very much. You used key words there, trade-offs, mitigation, adaptation, and financing. It's important to keep all of this um, in mind. And then to, um, to the next question, Maria Mercedes, how do you see the possibilities and challenges in the access to financing? Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Valeria. Thank you for this invitation. Since FAO, we're very excited to be able to participate in such an important panel, people who know this issue very well. So the main challenge could be skepticism, Not believing in what we're talking, not believing that the agriculture can be different. So the main challenge in that regard is to prove with real information, scientific data, that we can carry out sustainable, resilient agriculture, even in even low in emissions. So from FAO, we are supporting several projects in the region who are looking to face the changes of climate, um, the, of the climate crisis, promoting sustainable and resilient agriculture, and the benefits, as, mentioned, as Walter mentioned, is key also. So we have a publication in 2021. Excuse me. I think we are having some connection issues with Maria Mercedes. Oh, you're back. Yeah, something happened. Okay, I'm back. I was talking about how on certain countries, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Guatemala, Honduras, we have had many, even in Mexico, we have had great experiences on how to align the Paris Agreement with an inclusive and sustainable agriculture. And then there's the wrong perception that mitigation measures to climate change are more expensive than not. So in the FAO, we have 
carried out several research on that in our latest a 2019 report on uh, risks, we identified that each invested dollar in early um, prevention versus an adverse climate change scenario, there are additional benef benefits to um, the families which range between six and seven dollars. So it is more expensive not to adapt to climate change in agriculture and um, suffer the consequences so this convention is local um, national transnational public and private and what the, the countries um have now is to be part of, of, of the gap of course which is answering in uh, 5.3 billion um, capitalization, which are now available for countries. And then there is the World Fund uh, for the Environment, which is um, the ultimate mechanism to finance uh, contributions to climate change from countries. So there are international financing to which countries can have access to and complement with a fiscal fund. Once countries have shown that agriculture can be sustainable, then they can have fiscal uh, financing, which complement because this is this transformation is expensive if 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 it's not done on time. And so there are several sources of financing, both international and fiscal. Private sector, of course, has a key role in this sense. That's it from me. Thank you very much. Lucrecia, I don't know if you want to share something, you know, from um, their stance from the ICAC. Thank you very much. Yes, definitely. I believe that in, among those challenges, there's something that's very important. Resources, mobility. Um, already exists. What we are doing in the SICA country, eight countries that um, are part of Central America and the Dominican Republic, is to see how this resource movement is happening and take into account or tap into technology, for example, mapping of soils and a project that is actually uh, just beginning with um, FAO, which is to identify how the uh, productive processes are changing. Because if this is key information, this is strategic information, which will allow governments and producers to have a, an accurate decision-making. Why is this happening? Or why do we do this? Because to mobilize resources properly, we need to have an agriculture which knows what are their, their needs, that is mitigating risks. And something that's really important, which is restoration of soils, but of course, in an effective way. So what we are doing is an integral work. We are developing um, all eight countries on that regard. Um, we have young people included, women included, and there is a prioritization of them to be able to say, my goal is this one, I'm already doing this, and this is my gap. I think that this differentiation focus will allow us to generate trust, but also will allow us to see ourselves as the sector that effectively needs to execute those resources. We are executing resources, but we are doing so uh, properly, orderly. And so that's what we are doing in the region. And we are doing so at a regional level. Um, we have technical teams from all ministries to, to work on, um, on a political and technical side. Um, side by side. Thank you very much, Lucrecia. That complements very well what we were mentioning in innovation. Sabine, now that you mentioned uh, financing at the beginning, I don't know if you want to add something else to that before we go to another question. No, I think that that's a key issue 
the ecosystem of um, financing sources in a multilateral level uh, is there, as, as was mentioned, there are several sources. And then there's a commitment, especially from the last COP, which is the Financing Alliance, which has also mobilized private funds. At a, the declarational level, there are many um, funds that are available. And at a producer level, that's what I have to do with the day-to-day -day work, working with producers, working with um, value chains, so that those resources arrive to these people, are arrive to the producer. And so that this will allow them to, let's say, um, have a special disclosure to have access to other funding, which is not simple in the day to day. They uh, need to um, get used to reporting, uh, timely reporting without having knowledge transfer or awareness of this. And there are several funds that are available but need um, sovereign uh, guarantees through governments, of course. And this, of course, poses barriers to the producers, which ultimately is the one that has to mitigate, is the one that has to implement um, sequestration practices, and is the one that needs to increase their yield. So the bar is set very high, and the need to find incentives is the question that we, the ones who work um, on territories, are being asked, okay, who's paying for this? Not, not just the production, but who's paying for the work that um, is needed to be able to meet those requirements. And so how do we get these resources to the producers, to their plants in each of our local economies? Thank you very much, Savine. And so this is one of the main questions that I have regarding this issue. I think that there's a danger that of um, atomizing or, or diffusion of these funds that may happen. We have a lot of money, but what is the most efficient way to manage this? To don't have two different certifications, to uh, different applications uh, with different indicators, et cetera. This is what uh, makes so complex uh, having access to funds without increasing costs, uh, problems, uh, training, et cetera. So thank you very much for that. Now I would like to switch gears. Um, and I want to ask, what should be the role of the ministries of agriculture in this context? And not just that, but how do you see the interaction between uh, ministries? Because it's, it's not just agriculture ministry, but also environment ministry. So how would you handle that relationship? I don't know if, but I'm gonna say maybe you want to answer that question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valeria. Yeah, so in this case, Walter already mentioned the importance of planning, of national planning for um, climate change and the, uh, mitigation strategies, and even the definition at national level of the uh, determined um, national determined contributions. And so this is when both ministries, agriculture and environment, need to create a state policy. That would be the way in which we see that interaction between both ministries. After um, having a uh, full agriculture crops, uh, forestry, livestock, etc. We need to see how those two ministries converge. And we do that through planning, national planning, as I mentioned. There are countries where there are round tables on climate change where all sectors come together. Actually, Today we're talking about agriculture, but there are other sectors. States get together through roundtables, climate tables, mini, uh, broadened ministries. And this is where you can decide. We don't have to decide between producing more uh, food and affecting the climate. This can go hand in hand. We can have a transformation towards sustainable and resilient ag agriculture, which reactivates economy because of course post pandemic um we need to of course reactivate the economy and 
we need to consider this process as socially inclusive. We need to generate jobs, development, and incomes. So it's not just those two ministries that need to have a conversation. It needs to be a countrywide policy and a state policy. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Mercedes. Lucrecia, I don't know, maybe um, you want to contribute something from your uh, point. Thank you very much, Valeria. Yes, I wanted to share that from the Sika region, we already started that conversation that needs to take place between agriculture and environment. And that joint work that we are doing at a, on a political level, that's how we're going to the next COP, to COP27 to have a new intersectorial meeting. We have already had two. And what we are doing is uh, designing agendas and establishing what are the responsibilities that uh, have to do with agriculture, to have more active agriculture with the interest of resolving structural problems that the sector has in productivity, for example, which is one of the main challenges as was mentioned before, but that won't happen unless we um, have an order in what we're doing. And so we are developing a strategy, uh, a FOLU, which involves, of course, issues with uh, responsibilities in biodiversity, agroforestry, that's uh, the Achilles heel that has the agriculture, which is sustainable livestock management. And, and to have a um, value chain of livestock that of course um, can help us with food security. So that is why from CICAC, what we are doing is to have an integral approach to all the programs with adaptation mitigation, with strategic information. We already have the model functioning, which is what we're aiming at, so that the political instruments and strategies are ex uh, which are being executed are already validated on the field. I think that is um, what we are doing with the existing um, tools and capitalizing what is already there in innovation, in technology, to, um, you know, of course, lead by example. And leading by example is uh, to see the leaders of um, ministries of agriculture and environment talking to each other with a joint agenda. And we, of course, are facilitating this conversation, but um, doing so with technical requirements. We need to sit down technical teams from the from both ministries and the modify these um, issues which weren't talked about before, but we are doing so now and we are coordinating ourselves. That's of course uh, you know with a starting point that we have many issues. We're going to resolve some of them, but some won't. So let's just take out of the table uh, those issues in which we're not going to agree, but let's advance on those um, which we can agree on. So that's what we are doing from the Sika region. This is what we are doing already. And so an issue is just um, articulating everything. Uh, in NSS, for example, compliance, we are at training many producers because there are dispersed uh, practices, but we want all of them to work towards what we want. And we want to be seen as a different and resilient agriculture, which has a specific um, goal, specific north, and which is prioritizing the main issues that worry or that concern uh, producers, along with, of course, other issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lucrecia. 
before going on, I would like to remind you, if you have any questions for the panelists, please ask them using the hashtag of Ash, um, history in Twitter or on Facebook or YouTube or on the webpage uh, chat box, the webpage of this uh, event. And by this, I would like to cover now what would be the role of the private sector in this context. And for this, I would like to um, to know if Mina has something to tell us about this. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this panel. For myself, first, number one, it is that the private sector has a great responsibility um, in climate change. And really, um, its role should be um, within the total chain. That means in its relationship with producers where it is uh, buying products, it should have a more formal role specifically in integrating and in formalizing and getting more engaged at the, uh, the level of producers. And if it has to change its, its protocols and trainings um, in order to comply with the um, regulations and policies of the COP. And at the same time, I see that the private sector's role uh, may be very important if they are included in the uh, discussion board and discussion table, specifically in the formulation of plans and also in conversations directly with the government. Because if there is no connection between the private sector and the public sector, we are not going to achieve the goals that we need to achieve. And also, we must, uh, we must see what the plans that a private sector has are. Um, it's got its own plans in also achieving the goals. Not so much uh, domestic enterprises, but international enterprises that have presence in Latin American countries. Mm, most of international enterprises have their own plans with very, very aggressive uh, goals. And we must uh, take advantage of their plans, <clears throat> the investment that they have in the countries, and also with the producers and systems. And it may be that domestic enterprises um, can also have their own plans, but if we can um, match the results that each of them wants to achieve, that can also contribute to to the public sector in making their plans as well as their goals in the plans. Thank you very much, Brina. And I would like to ask a last question to Walter in terms of, he, uh, you worked a long time in, in the Ministry of Agriculture. S seeing it from inside, how, is that relationship between ministries and the private sector? Walter, I don't know if maybe you wanna share something with us just in one minute. Yes, um, I'm very pleased that I was uh, for 21 years in charge of the climate change unit of the Ministry of Agriculture. So I've gone through different moments of, of um, uh, cross ministerial relationships. Up to 2009 in Uruguay, we had a relationship, seeing climate change as an environmental issue and as an issue of the Ministry of Environment portfolio. And therefore, any attempt of the Ministry of Agriculture to integrate to that work was not easy, was not simple. We did not have complementary relationships, but it was most, it was more of competition of uh, starting from 2009, it radically changed because the new vision was that climate action is, is essentially a, a, a subject of development. Therefore, it involves and engages the Ministry of Environment, but also the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Social Development, but also a Public Health Ministry, et cetera. And also mm, local government's representation as well as consultation and financing of science and technology and the private sector. 
So what's called the uh, Climate Change Response National System was created. It, it make it cross-sided at the level of the government, at the national and sub-national levels, but it, but it also integrated um, the environments of consultations uh, from the productive sector and from the uh, academic sector. And that was an extremely positive change in the way of approaching this. And it legitimated the role of a Ministry of Agriculture. And up to now, competitions relationships started to be transformed more into natural complementarity relationships where the Ministry of Agriculture accepts the Ministry of Environment and its contributions to how to incorporate the environment into development, including climate action, without feeling that they are um, raiding you. And on the other hand, the Ministry of Agriculture is aware that productive policies must incorporate the environmental dimension in a very strong way and that for the design of policies, it is necessary to do it in a cooperative uh, cooperational way. And I think Ministry of Economy and Finance are also very important on that. Many countries have a fund for, for climate and Uruguay and Chile are issuing public debt um, tied to the compliance of environmental goals, which actually mean possible benefits in terms of reduction of the interest rates. So how to allocate fiscal resources. And if a Ministry of Finance does not understand that it is more expensive um, to, to cure than to prevent, um, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. It goes beyond the cross ministries relationship. And then the other thing that I believe is very important is of working in an articulated way, in a joint way, it's not only at a national level, but also at an international level, how to co-participate in the main international forums related to obviously climate action, climate action convention is an essential event. As what Federico said a moment ago, the COP27 is going to at some point give um, a light in regards to if countries can agree to continue in the agricultural work or not. And today we are in, in a difficult situation where there was a, a stage that was just finished and another stage is starting. How that new stage is gonna be? Well, that is something that we'll see if, um, if there are um, any, uh, conclusions on that. And finally, I think the agenda of the Ministry of Agriculture in regards to this uh, international subjects, it has to be broadened. It has to go beyond corrective actions. For instance, it started with the um, Glasgow Shamashek um, Agreement in the Global Adaptation um, Goal. It's not sectorial, but it is a vulnerable sector as it is agriculture. So how the global goal for an adaptation is going to develop and how it is going to incorporate the work in agriculture through adaptation and Ministry of Adaptation and also other entities. Well, the Ministry of Agriculture has to include this and it has to take uh, into account losses and damages because there are a lot in the sector. I'm getting to a conclusion now that it is difficult to, to approach the Ministry of Culture to international cooperation. But besides, it's, it's more complex because it's not only limited to continue uh, in this cooperation, but it has to be looking at other lanes where things are decided that end up being very important for agriculture. And of course, financing. So let's not limit ourselves to just cooperation, but we have way other things. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, Walter. And it's, it's nice to have the voice of experience. And now, um, Trina, I would like to ask you, what are the kinds of actions that US, uh, USA, uh, USAID uh, is taking to support the agricultural and food production sector in climate change? Thank you. 
Thanks. USAID has uh, years of working in climate change issues, specifically in the agricultural and livestock sector. In the COPE in Glasgow, um, we did the launching of the climate change policy. That's a public strategy. You can see the uh, policy in our website. And something that's very interesting is that within this plan, we put a goal in supporting 80 countries with, um, in the world, supporting them in, in their uh, plans. And in the COP in Egypt, we are going to launch something to coordinate within Latin America, the implementation of those actions in different countries. It's called CASI and it is, it is a comprehensive um, action plan against uh, climate change. And um, we know that there are legal, political, technical and uh, financing issues where we need to focus on plans to make sure that implementation is appropriate, is doing well. And specifically, we are going to make sure that this growth that we can see within or we can have within these plans, that this growth is, is, is properly inclusive. Is, that's very important for the agency. I also want to mention what's Feed the Future what Feed the Future is, which is an initiative that has uh, more than 10 years where the approach itself is in agriculture, but always in design and implementation um, where, um, of our challenges, where, where we, um, we see how to mitigate and decrease climate change. So that means that we're properly coordinating with the private sector as well as with the public sector at a national level and municipality level. And we're working on that in agroforestry, in uh, management of basins and micro basins, and also directly with producers as how we can uh, strengthen good agricultural practices and also in the um, adoption of new technologies and new practices, which can also strengthen resilience of producers on how they can face uh, climate changes. <clears throat> so that's also very, very important. At the same time, we have a project that's called CASA, which is an activity in the support of um, climate change, <clears throat> climate change adaptation. And in that, we also have five years in which we have invested resources in this activity. And this activity is also focused on the um, implementation of um, NDSS plans um, in several countries within the region. So as USAID um, and as part of the um, uh, Biden and Harris administration, we have a very strong uh, focus or approach in, in mitigating climate change. So for ourselves, it is um, a great priority. And I agree in Federico's presentation <clears throat> that we as an entity, we need to eliminate this division between what is climate change and agriculture because we need to, we need to join strategies. We need to um, uh, join our thought on how we can um, work more in agriculture in order to take advantage of policies and financing existing in climate change in general. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brina. It's in interesting to, to hear about the CASA initiative. I think in COP27, this can be um, very interesting to find out. Okay, we are about to wrap up this event and I would like to summarize a few questions that we have gotten from um, internet, especially from Marcelino Avila, but also many others. So I want to synthesize everything in just one question. What programs, projects, or initiatives could we propose to insert agriculture in the dialogue and the climate change agenda in COP27? I think all panelists have talked about this in this event, but 
I would like to give one minute each to see if you can in some way answer this question or give one final answer um, message. But again, one minute each. So I'm going to go in reverse order. And so we're going to start with Brina. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. As I mentioned on the last question, we are going to launch an initiative in COP27. And in that, I mean, that is our priority in the new strategy of climate change. And so you will get in this event, you'll get a lot more information. Um, which countries are we going to focus on, as well as the work that we are going to carry out in the implementation of those plans. We, because we have uh, funds to invest, invest in the fit the future countries, we have new projects on several countries in the region, which are going to start at the end of this year. And in each project, we have a different focus on how to mitigate climate change. So there's going to be a lot of work from USAID on this issue. Thank you, Brina. Lucrecia, a minute. Thank you. From our side, I would say that we are still presenting an order agenda in the frame of AFOLU and ordering from uh, soil restoration, which is one of our priorities to in, in, during this prog uh, process and accompanying strategic decision making, um, using innovation in agriculture and presenting um, presenting this joint agenda uh, of environment and agriculture, we're going to uh, this intersect in intersectorial meeting of the Americas and give this message of support and this joint agenda message and uh, present ourselves as this region that is already advancing in this issue. And what Brina was mentioning, those who are investing um, need to need us to identify the, the gaps so that we can um, use this fund more um, effectively, uh, programs and resources. We are working on the dry corridor of Central America. Uh, we know that cooperation has priorities, but we want them to go towards where ministries of environment and agriculture and governments are prioritizing so that we don't disperse the support that we already have. Thank you. Thank you, Lucrecia Maria Mercedes. One minute. Thank you. Look, the strategy of climate change, um, which Paul presented, um, during this past year, and which of course will be present in COP27, talks about three levels. Local level, broadening climate action with producers on the ground, especially those who are most vulnerable to climate change. At national level, capacity of um, the countries in public policy uh, creation to support this. And then at regional level, a strengthening of cooperation as Walter mentioned before, and go climate governance in negotiations, uh, specifically uh, support to Coronavia. These are the pillars of the strategy that were approved by the countries which um, participate in the FAO. And so we have our roadmap to advance. And then the final message, not demonize agriculture. Yes, Valeria, you already showed the impacts that agriculture may have, but it is also the solution. Agriculture is the solution. And I think this is very important to, to have as a takeaway from this event. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Mercedes. Yes, definitely we're part of the solution. Walter, one minute, if you can, thank you. 
Thank you very much. I'll piggyback on what Maria Mercedes said, not demonize agriculture. I think that in the negotiations, we need to link agriculture and food security. I believe that we need to be careful with not confusing agriculture on a primary level and the impact of the agri-food systems and in the analysis of the full life cycle. So agri-food uh, sector, yes, produced 34% of all um, world emissions, uh, but and it, it's not just production, but also transportation, et cetera, fuels that the ships that transport food um, use. So yes, agriculture is part of 30, that 34%, but we tend to confuse, or the public tends to confuse one thing with another. It's, it's actually between 14 and 17%. Food, of course, or, um, needs to be transported, but okay. I think that I would highlight, as the presidency of Egypt says, this should be the cup of implementation, not blah, 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 but of agreeing on mechanisms to implement this. Agriculture. Of course, we, we need to take uh, to, to keep an eye on, on Bolivia, but uh, we also need to keep an eye on, on um, the initiatives of uh, the COP and the FAO with different sectors. That's a reality. There's an, an initiative of on water, which of course water has a great connection to agriculture. Agriculture is on is in several spaces. I, I already consumed my sixty seconds, but I want to. I want to say that participating in the COP is very expensive and very few people, only for 40,000, but um, out of those 40,000, only two or 3,000 people are involved in agriculture. Um, it, it'd be great to broadcast the events that are happening on agriculture to everyone else. So, so just not only people who go to the COP can have access to those events. Thank you very much. Thank you, Walter. Yes, uh, definitely those in charge of the pavilion will record the sessions. And yes, we're going to um, we're going to post them as much as we can. And so message received and message accepted. Now, Sabine, you, yes, I want to, uh, to ag agree with everything that was said, but also what do we expect from the COP about innovation? What we're doing right now still isn't enough to get to the goal that we have set. So we have to think about how to implement policies. Where do we find that incentives so that this can be implemented and it has a result, a positive result, both in the increase of yield but also increase of environmental performance and the reduction of emissions or the environmental impact in general. And to, there's a key issue here, which is to think about a policy that looks for implementation and incorporation of both knowledge, because we've been um, saying that answers are, aren't unique, but each sector, each process has their own calculus, has their emission um, indicators, even a lot, one, uh, one lot next to another one have different impacts. So it's important that we start measuring um, our, with um, own indicators to have a val a valid, um, excuse me, value added, as Walter mentioned. But then we need to think about technological free conversion of the sector, new green technologies. And for that, we need investment. It, it goes back to that financing and going from discourse to implementation so that we can involve a digester in the process uh, to have um, a greener um, logistics, greener packaging, even new fertilizers with new technology or um, genetics that has a lower impact, lower environmental impact. But let's be innovative. Let's look for alternatives because we 
uh, need to get there. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great message. And of course, this makes us look forward to innovation. Federico, maybe in, uh, we, we have two minutes left. Maybe in those two minutes, you want to uh, say something about what we've mentioned so far? Two minutes, really. Okay, I'll try to do, in, to do it in even less time. Brilliant, great interventions today. They are all really um, valued. What Sabine was mentioning and what Walter was mentioning, I'll piggyback on. We need a new generation of public policies. It doesn't mean to uh, throw away what, ex what exists, but yes, we need to rethink about this when um, thinking about um, climate change to include social um, stakeholders. Brina mentioned this too, when we talk about social actors, private sector is key in design and implementation of those public policies, because it's not just the ministries who decide the policies. P policies can be decided in a public sector, but if the private sector is not involved in that design and implementation, surely we won't get even close to the results that we expect. We also talked about not demonize um, agriculture. The key is that agriculture is part of the solution. But does this mean? Of course, there are issues that are still going to, uh, can be improved, that will always happen. But there are things that are happening that are right, that are contributing to this idea that agriculture is part of the solution. We need to strengthen those initiatives so that those elements that are contributing to the solution are strengthened. And then I go back to the main issue, the new generation of public policies, a new, a new component of innovation in policy in a broader um, aspect of it when we involve all stakeholders. This is key. And then finally, COP27 will uh, take place in November. Surely many things will happen. Let's wait. Let's hope that this is the COP of implementation, but there will be follow um, other COPs, COP28, COP29, COP30, and climate crisis will not be resolved in one meeting. That's why it's essential, first of all, the involvement and engagement of all stakeholders, but not just engagement, but also commitment so that this new generation of public policies are really a reality in an upcoming future because we don't have much longer. All research shows that this is the day in which we need to resolve this. We have in the ICA, we have a public policy observatory because of course there are many countries where um, these policies are being developed and that can be used in the design of other public policies in other spaces. So I encourage you to follow us, uh, all the activities of this pavilion where most sectors will have great interventions, of course, as we hope happen. Thank you. Thank you, Federico. I don't want to repeat anything else. Very useful uh, comments and interventions. I thank you again, ICA, USAID, of course, for being our um, co -part our partners, uh, of course, of the IFPRI and our panelists, because you have been great. All the interventions that we had were great. And thank you for listening. If you have any other questions, you can um, keep sending them to IFPRI and those will be answered. Thank you to all of you and have a great day.